Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that this event takes place on Mianjin country. We pay our respects to the traditional owners, the Turrbal and the Yagara peoples and their elders past, present and emerging. We extend that respect to any First Nations people who are present today or online. We also acknowledge that Aboriginal sovereignty has never been ceded. Now, I'm really excited to introduce um, Adrian Baragaba to you all this morning. Uh, Adrian has had a long association with Checkup and in fact launched, was here or down at the Indigenous radio station in 2016 when we launched our Innovate Wrap. So today, as you know, we're launching our Stretch Wrap. Uh, Adrian is from the Babinbara clan of the Wongan and Jagalingu people of central Queensland. He was born in Brisbane and is recognised by the traditional owners as having historical connection. So Adrian, um, over to you. A, a very warm welcome from all of us here today. Thank you. My name is Adrian Buragawa. I come from central Queensland in the Galilee Basin. This is a Jagalingu country. This is the place of the emu. And uh, my grandfather, great grandfather, comes from Wangan, from the uh, Claremont area. So uh, we're the original people from there. And uh, while I'm in Brisbane, I pay respects to traditional owners and custodians of this land, the uh, ancestors on whose land we stand, nor is the uh, elders, past and present as well. And uh, with, uh, with, in their languages, we say Warabuli, that's like hello, and it's, uh, it's like you're saying, you say goodbye, it's not goodbye, it's just part of the So, greetings every day. Thanks for having me come today to, uh, to perform for you. Uh, yeah, so I uh, haven't performed for a while, so, uh, you know, never get rusty at these kind of things. You just keep doing it. But, um, no, thanks for having me here today. And uh, we're like with um, our Woody language. Um, we, uh, we sing and dance and, and uh, we practice our culture and it's all based on our language. So that original language we speak, like uh, it's the Murray language, you know, it's, it's, uh, from Central Queens and it's Woody. So um, from that, we, we derive our music, a song and, and our dance. And so, uh, it's a part of it's a part of our, our customer and law that we uh, we hand down our, our culture and uh, the stories of, of our uh, totems and, uh, and how we are connected to the land. In that way, um, we build self esteem and um, and respect in, in in their people and the young people, so they can go forward and uh, reconnect with the land and uh, associate their, their culture with. Uh, their past history, and uh, it's the way forward for them. So we do this on a regular basis, and uh, I'm going to demonstrate uh, some of, some of our culture here today. And uh, <clears throat> we now play we now play the ditch. It's uh, it's it's something that uh, it's a progressive thing that we uh, it's a part of our culture now. So when when we play, yeah. So. Anyway, um, <laughs> I'm just gonna like play a little bit of didgeridoo for you, but uh, I'll sing first so that you've got the rhythm so you understand where I'm, where I'm coming from. So you can see me all right? Yep, you're right in shot there. That's great. And Lynette, could you um, turn your microphone off, please? Someone can. Yeah.
اين اين اسوار دي تلو سوار ابو ماي مسافا ومود كذا اني اكمل في ذا دوم اوف ذا سبرينج ات فلايز ات ويرت تو جيف ات تو سنترال ويسترن كوين سنترال ويسترن كوين زين اند وي ذا هيد وور اوف اول كانتري فروم ذير تو ثرو فروم ا جاكلينج كانتري تو بيجرو كانتري داون تو ماريجان تو كالالي تو كوما تو غوموروي اول ذا كانتري اول اف ذا وور اند وي ذا هيد وور از ذات with the story of the Mundaka, Rainbow Seven even travels out to the ocean all the way out here to Stradbroke to tell the story of the Mundaka. And so where the headwater is, that's the place of the Dungabur Springs, the place of many waters. This is the place where our ancestors come from. My father, my great-grandfather, and he is his father for him. And, and my, my great-grandmother, she comes from out for there. And so when we tell that story of the Rainbow Serpent, we tell the story of, of creation, how things all came into being. In the beginning, in the creation period, when, uh, when the great spirit uh, put the sun in the sky, the Dari, he I mean, the Gari is the sun. When the sun shined upon the earth, it was a dark void place. And then as it shone on the earth, there was mist that covered the earth. And through that mist, there appeared the rainbow, the Mundakata. And as the Mundakata fell to the earth, uh, the, 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 the Dari and uh, with the with the, with the Damu Damu, uh, Created all, all living things. And from that water, it, uh, it comes down from the middle of the earth. So it travels on the, 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 the surface of the earth, it travels in and through the earth. And this is a story of creation. So water is life, meaning it's literal, it's like the beginning of all things, and it creates things now. And that's why we have that, uh, that Rainbow Seven story. And today it's relevant now to, uh, to, to everything. With, uh, with, uh, with climate change and uh, with the environment, that we, uh, we maintain these stories and their songs and their dances to continue on with our dreaming and our story of our ancestor dream. So those ancestor dreams are it's very important to, uh, to maintain our, our culture and the law and custom in, in, uh, in our society. So I'd like to sing you this song here about Mandanjara, Mandanjara, the Mundakara that travels under the earth. Sleeps in the in the barber in the in the in the deep gully. So that's the, the kamu kamu where all things come from, from water. So I'll sing you this and then I'll play a little bit of it just to show you like a, a rhythm. Mandinjara, 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 Saying their names 
and by declaring that they are the original people from this land and by acknowledging that and paying respect to that we then become a part of that that you know historical event the creation period and so we then we go forward you know in harmony and that's why uh, it's, it's very important that you know we continue with that process acknowledging those old people uh, and the ancestors so yeah um i'd like to play a little bit more ditch if that's all right um uh, yeah i've got a lot of stuff you know what i mean but i just gotta pick out the, whatever 15 minutes so <laughs> i know <laughs> so anyway um this is this is this is a song about like uh hunting and gathering <laughs> Yeah. 
sort of really difficult this one. So it comes from right out here. And so you make it sound like and that's uh that's really how you do it. <laughs> Okay, so the real difficult part is trying to play all that together. So you have to remember to breathe in. While you're breathing in, blowing out, you make sound with your, with your, with your lips, and, you, and you're, you're vocalizing these things. So, um, yeah, if you don't have rhythm, if you're trying to play didgeridoo, you just make a noise. So, don't try it unless you like working on rhythm. <laughs> so, it's sort of just, I'm not just demonstrating the different sound because, like, a lot of people they don't explain it, they don't explain what's going on. So, anyway. <laughs> Um, now, our first presentation uh, this morning is from Kieran Chilcott. Kieran is the CEO of Calwyn Health Service on the Gold Coast. He's also a checkup board director and he chairs Checkup's Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Advisory Committee. Um, and Kieran joins us today. I believe you're in Longreach. Is that correct, Kieran? That's correct, David. Okay, so thank you for providing our opening address today. Over to you, Kieran. Can you get me fine, David? Yes, perfect. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for that beautiful welcome. I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land that we all meet and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I guess probably, you know, for an open, the theme of um, 2022 National Reconciliation Week is be brave and make change. And, um, you know, I sit here before you as a proud Aboriginal man who's been involved with Checkup for nearly two years now um, and then confident on the journey and, and the brave journey that um, Checkup has taken over the past two years. So be brave, make change is the theme this year. So the work that we do at Checkup and the outcomes that we've been able to achieve for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities across Queensland and Australia is, has been making a significant difference in the lives of my people right now, but also into the future. So the plants that we see, um, the, the, the seeds that we're planting today, um, some of us won't be around to see the, um, the outcome of these future generations, but the work that we've been doing has been significant. So our bravery has not only extended to the work that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. As an organisation, we've made some systematic changes um, to embed Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander perspectives and priorities in all that we do at Checkup. And this has, include, this has included um, the board appointing me as a First Nations director, but then also the director um, endorsing and supporting the establishment of an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander advisory subcommittee um, to the board. And therefore we do have a direct Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice going um, straight to our board and the ability to make recommendations um, you know, by my people for my people. So that has been something that I've been proud to be a part of. The organisation long before I've been around has been on a, um, on a journey of reconciliation and has um, shown a strong, uh, demonstrated a strong commitment to reconciliation, um, including the implementation of their reconciliation action plan. Uh, but I'm also excited around the organisation's change for the future and, and the fact that we've very recently appointed a new Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander lead within the organisation. So, you know, whilst, um, whilst this year's theme is be brave um, and make change, our organisation has been very brave over the years and we continue to make change. And we're not only making changes for the organisation, but we're making changes in the betterment um, of the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people across Queensland and Australia. So it's something that I'm really proud to be a part of and, and something that I'm thankful for because 
we do have quite a few uh, partners that we work with, with both um, both in the Aboriginal community controlled health sector, but then more broadly, um, you know, with mainstream health providers who have also shown that um, same level of commitment. So today I extend um, that big thank you to you all um, who are there in the room, but also our members and our supporters and, and people who embark on this journey because it is something that no, not one single person will be able to make a difference, but collective impact and the difference that we continue to make together on the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and communities is something um, that I have been extremely proud to be a part of. Um, and I'm proud of not only the fact that we've got an executive team that leads it out, but I can see within the organisation, um, the commitment is embedded at all levels. So uh, thank you to our members and our supporters. Um, we've been on a very excited, uh, exciting journey, but I feel like our future is even brighter. Um, and, you know, I, we, we don't leave celebrating national reconciliation uh, re reconciliation for this one week. Let's continue to embed reconciliation in all that we do each and every day um, for the improvement of the lives of my people. So thank you for those of you who are in the room um, and welcome. And I hope that we have a, a, an amazing day. I'm so, sorry, I can't hang around. I, I am in long reach um, and I'm going to make the difference in the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people out here for the rest of the day. So thank you. Thanks, David. Thanks so much, Karen. Now, our next presentation is from Haleen Grogan. Haleen is the Chief Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Officer and Deputy Director General of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Division of Queensland Health. Is that correct? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Haleen is becoming a bit of a regular at our QPHCN meeting. She was at this corresponding meeting this time last year and she presented also in February around what Queensland Health's doing around workforce issues. That was our previous topic. So thanks so much um, for coming again and, and taking time out of what is, I'm sure, an incredibly busy schedule uh, to mark such an important occasion as National Reconciliation Week with us. So welcome, Hayley. Please make a welcome. Don't worry about the presentation. No? I'll, I'll no. Come. I can put I'm them into all that trouble. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I won't follow the script. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, you can send it as a handout. Maybe. Okay. That's yeah. fine. I was going to tell you that. Yeah, I saw you looking for it. No worries. That I get. I'll highlight you. Yeah. Um, spotlight for everyone. Yeah. And I've got half an hour, so I'd probably yeah. like to take questions would be yeah. good. So I'll try and say my spiel in a couple of minutes. Um, and I'll start by acknowledging traditional custodians of the land where each and every one of us live and work across this beautiful state of ours. Um, including everyone who's online and pay my respects to elders past and present. I always get take the opportunity, every day I get this opportunity, which is um, important to me, to um, thank my elders for the privileges I get to work on. If it wasn't for their work, I would, and some of those elders I think might be even online. Um, so um, it's really important that I get to get, get that opportunity. Look, National Reconciliation Week this year is about being brave and make change. And I think that's what I do every day of my life. <laughs> And um, I've got a handout, but I'll just talk because um, it's easier for me just to tell the story. We've got a massive agenda about being brave in Queensland. And as Kieran um, highlighted, I think our future is probably one of the most um, in all, all of the country. Um, here in Queensland Health, um, we are embarking on a journey with our community control sector that's really exciting. I might go back. Some of you may know that I headed up the Aboriginal and Health Branch over 10 years ago. Um, I've been working with Anne-Marie Liddy for some time, even previously when I was in the Commonwealth. So um, uh, an important colleague of ours, an important role that Checkup plays. Um, 10 years ago, we launched Making Tracks, and it's actually over 10 years ago, it was 2010. We launched Making Tracks, um, to, um, making, tracks towards, uh, um, making Tracks towards Closing the Gap by 2033. And at the same time, we launched an average capability framework. I went away, I left health in about 2010. So that was 2007, sorry. I left health in 2010 and I went away for about 10 years. In that time that I was away, there was a landmark report that was co-sponsored by Quaith and the then Anti-Discrimination Commission that highlighted institutional, barriers to institutional racism in Queensland Health. So, um, Part of me is really saddened by the fact that we actually had a policy framework about making tracks and we had a cultural capability framework. But um, 
the implementation of that framework wasn't as effective as we would have hoped. Um, but welcome the outcome of that report to highlight what was not going right for our mob. And one of the recommendations from that report was to establish this position that I'm in. So it's a really privilege and an honour for me to come back and um, take this role. I wasn't coming back to help, but when um, this role was established, I knew, given the fact that I started off as an Aboriginal health worker with Chopin Aboriginal Medical Service, and um, started nursing in 1983 at Cairns-based hospital and was a midwife, and then became an administrator in the system and grew up in Queensland Health. <laughs> So for me, coming back was the next natural step and something that I'm really excited that I did. Um, I've come back, they've, they've um, established this position, but the government, the current government also took a big brave step and they may introduce some legislation changes in 2020, August 2020, I'm sorry, November 2020. And that change was for our hospital and health services to um, include um, Aboriginal representation on all their boards to and required every HHS to co-design health equity strategies. And then in 2021, in April, um, they did amendments to the regulation. So those of you who understand law, I don't, I've been working in policy for some time, but you have legislation in, in the health, we have lots of regulation that actually designs what that legislation is supposed to do. So the regulation amendments stipulated the requirements of what the equity strategies were to do. So it was to co-design with the community and in particular community control sector. And it was, it requires every HHS to articulate how they're going to work with the social determinants of health. It they have to articulate how they're gonna actually make changes to health improvements, how they're gonna provide culturally appropriate care. Um, and the most, the, the two significant ones that are really exciting is um, they are required to have um, strategies in place to ensure that they have First Nations workforce proportionate to the First Nations population that they serve across every category and every level. And the last regulation change, the most significant one, is they have to articulate how they're gonna eliminate racism. And those words are in the regulation. So I don't know whether the Queensland government knew how brave they really were when those changes were introduced and, and the regulations. So that was in April last year and HHS's hospital health services had 12 months to deliver on those equity strategies and I'm just in the throes of receiving them in draft and commenting on them. We've received, I hope I get this right, 10 thus far. We've received initial drafts from all 16 HHS's and we've received 10 as final drafts and I've commented on seven. So, um, and the minister has given an extension on the election commitment, the requirement to deliver by April was an election commitment. Um, is been that that time frame has been extended to September. I know we use COVID for a lot of excuses, but COVID was a massive disrupt disruptor in our lives. Certainly, wasn't the journey I came back to to um, to um, to undertake when I when I came back to health. But certainly, a privilege that I was there to um, play a part in protecting our mob from COVID. And um, while it was a big disruptor, it, it's actually caused lots and lots of innovation and we're doing lots of things that we never thought we could do. So now we're embarking on establishing um, my, this role for the future. Um, all of that work that I've, we're embarking on now, I've put it down to three things and Kieran touched on in his opening um, remarks. Uh, we want our people in the system. That's from, and I've said this for decades, from gardeners to surgeons. We want a voice in the system. As Kieran said, you know, having a voice in terms of the governance structures that we have, and it's a start to have require HHS to have Aboriginal people on their boards, and we want a coordinated, capable, and accessible system. And achieving those three things takes a fair bit of work. Um, so that's probably it in a nutshell, where I want to end because I'd probably like to take some questions. Is have I got? Am I allowed to take questions? <laughs> um, uh, and yeah, just want to acknowledge the Aboriginal leadership in the community control sector. It's really exciting um, journey that we're embarking on. I might just, um, and Kieran certainly is one of the leaders in that. And I think you said Mulling was on, so I'm assuming Gail's on online and want to acknowledge our community control sector is, is the most, and I know we're going through some challenges at the moment, but we've got the, the strongest sector with the best leaders in this country, in this state. And the other states are looking at what we're doing. The other agencies in Queensland government are looking at what we're doing and following suit. And I don't know whether you're up to speed, Anne-Marie, but the Department of Health, so the hospital and health service, 16 of them, um, are 
the old days, we used to have a central office. It was a central um, centralised system. We now have a network system and the Department of Health is currently going through some proposed changes. Um, I might put it out there in terms of what they're proposing for us. Um, and we're going through staff consultation as we speak. So we, were, we are a division. The proposal is to um, um, put us above all the other divisions and be alongside the Office of the Director General and become an Office of First Nations Health. And my position will not be as a Deputy Director General, because I've got a massive title, Chief Aboriginal Health Officer and Deputy Director General. Um, it'll be a Chief First Nations Health Officer in the Office of the Director General, but as a specific office with authority over all the other divisions and each and every one of the divisions, some gone, some new. Um, there's been a big realignment. Um, the requirement of every DDG, will, they will have accountability to deliver on First Nations health equity, written in their role descriptions and their performance agreements. So um, very much welcoming the changes that have been proposed and really excited about becoming an office of the First Nations health in Queensland. And um, yeah, I might stop there because I can't talk a lot. <laughs> but send this hand out because I didn't say to the script. Yeah, we will. Um, by the way, we will be sending all presentations out to everyone online in the room uh, and also the, the handout that Hayley's got. We've got a comment here. Yeah. Um, not a question per se, but uh, Sarah Venn, who works at Health Workforce Queensland, uh, the health equity strategy is a wonderful enabler to connect the community control sector and the HHS as well. Oh, sorry, HHSs, as well as broader collaboration to improve cultural responsiveness for our communities and our health workers. So, yep. spot on there, Sarah. Simply said, if you have black fellows in the system, you'll get cultural capability. It's a pretty simple concept. <laughs> um, and I just might just add, and I did speak to um, you in February, was it, about our workforce strategy? Yeah, part of, um, in, in addition to the legislative changes, we've got a government election commitment requiring. Um, us to lead a, a, a health workforce strategy for Queensland, not for Queensland Health, for Queensland. So that is another innovative, another huge step, you know, and that's going to be a quite a big challenge because we actually want to have our people in the system across the health system. And it doesn't matter if Dr. Mark Wenatong, I'll call him out, whether he's working for the community control sector or us, the net difference is exactly the same. So we're going to work hard on getting um, our mob across the system. And um, that's a really exciting piece of work. We've um, consulted with Health Workforce Queensland and we're going to be doing releasing hopefully the, the concept paper on that. It's, it's not another strategy. It's a strategy for action. It's got 34 actions in it. I haven't briefed the minister and the DG on them all yet, um, but we're going to put the release hopefully out later this month. Oh. Yeah, this by in June. Yeah, later this month, um, uh, to form for a targeted consultation. So it won't go to public consultation, but we'll definitely be doing targeted consultations on that piece of work, which I'm really excited about. Mm -hmm. David and Pam Marie, can I just ask a question of or a comment? Thanks, Anne Marie. Yeah, hi, Hayleen. Sorry, I can't be there in person, but just wanted to say congratulations on those changes. Um, that's a really big step forward. And yep. uh, I think really um, well-deserved recognition of the work that you and your team have been, you know, have been contributing. I I'm just interested to know, do you think that's uh, something that other government departments will follow? Or it, it seems to me yeah. that Queensland Health is very much playing a leading role in establishing or following, establishing that office. Yeah, in fact, the Department of Community Housing and Digital Economy, Chatty have um, definitely followed suit. They've advertised recently for a Deputy Director General to head up a First Nation strategy unit. So it's community housing and digital economy and that strategy unit, similar to what's being proposed for me, is, is going to be a unit across all those portfolios. So not just for Aboriginal housing, but for the whole portfolio in that, in that department. Um, very similar to what Sean's proposing for us in terms of, and I was really pleased, um, Sean as Acting Director General said, you know, you're not responsible, Haleen, for the delivery of health equity. I'm responsible with the minister and every deputy director general has to deliver on that. And while you exist as a division, you're letting everyone else off the hook in terms of delivering. So that's why you put us as an office elevating in terms of a support and facilitated. But yes, Emory, yes, very, very excited about the changes coming forward. And yes, I think other departments, certainly Chatty has followed suit, other departments are looking and I think the journey that we're going on in terms of closing the gap with all the other portfolios. And we've got, again, I think our peak bodies are start, um, quite, 
comment, uh, the peak bodies are, have come back together um, on that journey. And like I said, you know, we've got a really strong community controlled health sector, but we've actually got a really strong community control sector in Queensland as well. Yes. Hey, there's no further questions in the chat. Anything from the room here? Yes, um, I'll just introduce, I was going to introduce you, Jennifer. Jennifer Power is another of our checkup board directors. So welcome, Jennifer. Yeah. Thank you, David. And hi, um, hi everyone. I can see some um, familiar faces. Um, Pauline, Similar to what um, Anne Marie said, just just brilliant to hear what's come forward. And uh, mm. oh, I thought you were going to hand me no. that. No, I was <laughs> go, oh no! Um, just really brilliant to hear yeah. all of those uh, steps. And as you say, the leadership and um, and courage. Last last week we had our uh, board meeting. And at that board meeting, we were briefed on the 10-year um, primary health care plan. Mm. And as I was listening to the steps being taken, the leadership and the courage, where were First Nations? Um, That's a Commonwealth plan? Yeah. yeah. Commonwealth. Uh, I'm just trying to get the sense of alignment of we have the closing the yeah. gap and the very clear strategy and leadership and courage. Where were the First Nations um, representatives in the, in the context of the Commonwealth and all of the working groups around the 10-year primary yeah. health care plan? I actually don't know because no. I'm in the state, but no. I do know that Quake was involved and I'm pretty confident Adrian Carson as a rep board director. Is Kieran still on? Yeah. No, no, he's, no he's not. To I'm pretty sure Adrian was involved and in terms of the extent of other other Aboriginal involvement, I'm not sure. Mm. I don't think the Commonwealth got away with not involving the community yes. control sector and certainly not involving NARC. Yeah. If I can just add, Haleen, um, I think in the documents, it definitely um, provides evidence of Nacho's involvement and I think Adrian and others were also involved. Um, yeah. I guess it's, it comes down to how that translates in the implementation of the plan. Yeah, absolutely. And, and probably just to add to that, in terms of um, the changes in, in Queensland Health, you know, structural changes in the department, we're, we've got massive reform agendas, you know, there's a departmental change, we're, we're going to streamline our governance structures, so they're the foundational reforms. They're looking at enablers reforms, they're looking at IT reform, workforce reforms, uh, capital works reform, so all those enablers. We've got a 10 year plan taking us to 2032, um, where we're going to go. And then there's um, models of care that have come out of COVID learnings, obviously, um, that are massive reform. So all those reform agendas, putting them together is a massive um, foundation for the future. The one thing we're trying to get right, which has to be the intersect between this primary health care um, plan is better primary health care to reduce the demand on the secondary health care of hospitals. It's, it's simple, but we haven't got that right. And that's the changes are about trying to ensure that we can actually um, bolster primary health care and, and then reduce the demand on, on our hospital system because um, going forward, we're just not going to cope with the demand that we, we've experienced even the last couple of years and are about to experience through winter with um, this flu, flu and pandemic. And... Um, oh, I lost my thought then. I was going to make another comment. Uh, but that's that's the whole foundation of what we're trying to get right. Oh, sorry. And you think we got it right by 2022, but we haven't. Um, get the patient journey, you know, from home into hospital and back, better coordinated. <laughs> we're doing a couple of pieces of work around First Nations in Cairns and um, Cairns and Torres and Cape to try it. They've got it setting up a bit of a PMO, program management office, to do, to like support the patient journey from home into hospital and back. So it doesn't matter who's providing the care along that journey, but it's coordinated. It's very, we're very clinician. I'm just going to say it. We're very clinician centric. Yes. It's all about making sure the doctors, no disrespect to our doctors and nurses. Yes. It's not about, and we've got to make it about our patients. Yeah. And um, just final, uh, final question. So you hear um, clearly um, sort of also speaking on behalf of the new wrong direction. When will... Um, when will sort of the department start to sort of step out of the transparency of 
First of July. Press and go. <laughs> That's what Sean's wanting to do. First of July. Staff have got, yeah, so the changes that we're uh, currently being, um, we're going through the whole union, make sure, you know, the, no, no positions being um, spilled, um, no additional. We've got our budget, we've got our resources, we've, we're making changes within that. Um, so, yeah, but 1st of July, press go. <laughs> yeah. Any further questions, either online or in the room? Uh, David, it's Henry. I think there was a question online. Uh, I can't see it. Uh, so if you like, okay. I, I, do you want me to read it out? Oh, there's another thing called Q&A. Yeah. I don't know about that either. Um, yeah, could you read it out? Because it's just not showing up here. Okay. All right. So this is a question from Pauline. Um, and Pauline... Uh, says mental health is a big part of our First Nation people mm. getting better. Will the HHSs have representation from mental health to co-design culturally appropriate services? I'll get John Allen to answer that question. <laughs> Head of mental health and alcohol. Absolutely. It's a massive agenda. Um, <clears throat> can I just say it's a personal just recently, I've got a niece going through some mental health challenges. So I'm seeing firsthand the lack of coordination in our mental health system, I'm just gonna say it, um, how it is totally not patient centric. We've got a mental health act that is, oh, can I get away with saying it's white? <laughs> um, it doesn't have First Nations perspectives. Um, it's just doesn't cater for us. So um, thankfully the timing is that we've, Got a mental health select committee. I think it's finished its work now, but I had the opportunity alongside Cleveland Fake and the CR of Quake and others to present at that select committee. Other, in addition to presenting, I've provided recommendations and um, some um, a suite of recommendations, including amendments to the Mental Health Act to incorporate cultural perspectives. Um, I'll just talk a little bit about my and yes is the answer yes i'm going to this is one of my new things that i'm going to be advocating for because of the personal lived experience that i've had recently and i'm not you know my niece has um probably gone through more difficult times than i have i'm i'm a support to her but she gets admitted in one mental health unit on one side of the river she goes to another mental health unit gets admitted on the other side of the river and then she gets in an over like because the one of the hospitals couldn't take her in one of the saturday nights she gets to an overflow to the north of, of brisbane Another mental health unit, and none of those mental health units share their notes. <laughs> so the story is not even shared. And how can you even care for someone if who's in a psychotic state and you don't know the full story because all you're getting is a slice of that story at a moment in time? How can you? Um, so yes, definitely we've got to get that right. Um, and definitely the fact that there's a big focus on mental health and certainly we've, we've got, um, we're getting some dedicated budget for that. Um, we'll definitely be getting our hands all over what happens in that space, um, including having First Nations people in that system. Absolutely. Okay. Any further questions or yeah. not? Oh, we do have that one from Aidan, who's our Hi, Aiden. general manager for Outreach Health Services. So over you, Aiden. Hi, Helen. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I just had a question, if we were to put aside the barriers and the challenges that we're facing in our industry, what would our health system be doing differently tomorrow that we're not doing today? Yeah. I just want to jump to say having, you know, black fellas everywhere. <laughs> I, look, I, I say it, I've been talking about it for 10 years, but I'm actually quite serious. If we have our mob in the system at every from gardeners, I talk about how important gardeners are. I'm serious, gardeners are just important as the doctor that's you know doing the surgery in terms of making a hospital welcome. It's really important. If we have our mob in the system, that's the one thing I really want to change is put in place enough of the um, strategies for supply through to keeping people in the system. So the whole continuum of them, that employment continuum, which is a lot of work because, um, and we've Proudly, we've got a new health certified agreement for health workers in Queensland Health, which now finally recognises them as um, genuine and valued cultural brokers in the system. We've still got a long way to go, but they've got their own certified agreement in Queensland Health. Um, and But we've got a lot of work to do because if you're a health worker in Thursday Island, uh, sorry, if you're a school 
in school on Thursday Island in high school and you want to become a health worker, where do you go? Now, I'm not dismissing the importance of doctors and nurses and allied health and all the rest, but our Aboriginal health workers um, have been, we, 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 we've got a portfolio where we've actually got cultural brokers in a system, unlike others, other portfolios, and, um, but there's no way to go. So one of the things I really want to change is access to the training and development for health workers. We need an infrastructure, a statewide infrastructure. We've got the VET packages, the vocational education training packages, and the training providers, there's four that can provide it, two only provide it in Queensland. Um, we've got a massive piece of work to do there. I've asked the ambulance, who's a registered training organisation, an RTO, and they provide training statewide and they do a really good job. And they have blackfellas in their system and they keep them. And um, they're doing a review to see what might be re what's required to set up the infrastructure for health workers. So mine is, I just want our mob in the system everywhere, community control, Queensland Health, wherever, GP land, makes a difference and um, even um, in terms of cultural so I think Kieran touched on it in terms of cultural perspective from a physical point of view Caboolture Hospital is undergoing a massive um, developing a new hospital or setting up a new hospital and the plans are exceptional they did this really big engagement with the traditional custodians up there and they've got Aboriginal art incorporated into the way they've built the building, they've got the design in terms of where there can be meeting places. It's it's exceptional. Bush Hospital will be completely transformed. Um, it's something that's really, really exciting and um, yeah, really, really welcome. And I've answered your question, but okay. and um, with, can I end with one thing? Yeah, one last comment. Yep. First Nations first. <laughs> it's as simple as that. And that's what we want in all of, in terms of incorporating. And um, I say that a bit flippantly, but it's actually another one of my serious remarks. And when I get the premier to say it, I've succeeded. <laughs> Easy to remember. I'll get it to minister in the DG first. <laughs> okay, please join me in thanking Aileen. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, go, go. Yeah, I thought you may have to go. Yeah. So again, thanks for your the generosity of your time today. Yeah. It's really Thank appreciated. Hope you're able to go. Thanks, Anne Marie. <laughs> See you later. Okay, our next item on the agenda is um, a conversation um, between Anne Marie Liddy, our CEO, and Lynette Anderson. And I'll get Anne Marie um, to introduce Lynn. Uh, so, Anne Marie, would you, uh, Lynn, can you put your camera on if possible? And David, while, while, while that's happening, I might just um, say good morning to everyone and uh, acknowledge um, the beautiful welcome from Adrian Baragaba and also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which um, all of us are meeting today. For me, I'm in Yagara country on the north side of the, of the river, um, but I also want to acknowledge um, everyone in the room, particularly our colleagues from Quake and others online. Um, from across Queensland. Um, I'm just waiting to see if Lynette perhaps wants to put your um, camera on or at least probably turn off your mute, Lynette. Okay. Okay. Um. While well, we're just figuring that out. Oh, here she is. There's. Oh. <laughs> Lynette's just popped out. <laughs> when she comes back up. All right. Okay. That's all right. We'll, we'll continue in a minute. We'll see that. <laughs> that's all right. Um, <laughs> everyone else is in the room. Lynette will be back in a minute. David, um, what I might do is just um, let everyone know that. Uh, Kieran alluded before to the fact that we, um, in our stretch wrap, had, um, I guess, committed to creating um, or attracting more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to work in checkup uh, and not just at entry positions, at all levels across the organisation. And that's been one of the most significant changes that we've wanted to make for our organisation over the last couple of years. Um, so that means that we've uh, looked at a board level, advice to the board, 
But probably the gap in our organisation was that at a management level, we didn't have an identified position. And that was something that we really do feel very strongly about, that if we are going to um, be serious about our commitment uh, to making our organisation an inclusive one, um, then it's important that we recognise the importance at a management level of a, an identified role. And hopefully in the future, it will be more than one. So we recently have advertised and recruited for an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health lead um, in our organisation. And um, I'm pleased to confirm that that position has been, or that Lynette Anderson has accepted that role uh, in the organisation. And Lynette um, is based in our Townsville office and she's only just recently started in the role, but we thought today was a perfect opportunity um, to have a talk with Lynette, um, perhaps a little bit about her background, but also how she sees this role of the importance of this role to check up. So that's kind of my introduction. I'm seeing on my screen that there's a few things happening. I'm not sure, David, where we're up to. Okay, can I just firstly check, can you see the Be Brave Make Change? Yes. Okay. Yep, great. Yes. Um, all right, well, we'll just wait for Lynn. What we might do though, yeah, okay. Being very flexible today. Um, so as you know, shortly we're going to be launching our stretch wrap. Um, so Amory and I will be talking to you about that um, soon. One moment. So we're really pleased um, that Reconciliation Queensland can join us today. And we have the CEO who I think has been in the role about six months. Yep, and that's Erin Lane. Um, you hosted a really terrific uh, National Reconciliation Week breakfast at Parliament House last week, which uh, we had a table there of checkup staff, uh, a really fantastic event. And it's really great that you're able to come uh, here today to tell us a little bit about the work of Reconciliation Queensland. So over to you, Erin. Thanks. Please make Erin welcome. Um, okay, so I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners, the Yagara Turrbal people. Um, I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, um, especially if there are any elders or First Nations people joining us today. Um, I would also like to make and say thank you to our elders that have come before us, because if it wasn't for our elders being brave and demanding change, we wouldn't be here today and there definitely wouldn't be First Nations people in positions like we have recently put in um, Parliament. Um, my name is Erin Lang. I am a Bundjalung woman. Um, my country is the northern New South Wales coast, so my family is from Fingal and around Tweed. Um, and I grew up on Turrbal country. Um, okay, thank you for having me here today and thank you for your organisation taking the time out to celebrate Reconciliation Week. Um, However, I do believe Reconciliation Week is more than just a celebration. Um, I think it is an ongoing reminder to reflect and take action. It is also a week of learning. I think with all of the social media things that we have going around and all of the events, which quite a few are even free, I think this is a perfect opportunity for people to take on their own reconciliation journey and do a lot of their learning themselves. Um, something we've been doing a lot of work with lately is that it becomes quite tiring for First Nations people to constantly be educating non-Indigenous people about stuff that we've been talking about for such a long time. So we are starting to ask non-Indigenous people to take on your own reconciliation journey and use the resources and stuff that we have like Reconciliation Australia and all of the other state reconciliation bodies like Reconciliation Queensland to access resources and take it upon yourself to teach and learn stuff that we have not learned in our schools. Um, for me, uh, Reconciled Australia is a place where First Nations people and non-Indigenous people are able to come together and understand each other's perspectives and understand each other and understand our shared histories. The path of reconciliation involves truth telling and realising that much of our history has been kept from us. Um, how do we take action? RQI supports and promotes organisations involved in a wide array of activities that engage in Queensland's 
Queenslanders in conversations about reconciliation. RQI is here to support businesses on their reconciliation journey. We are also here to help with the hard conversations. We work alongside Reconciliation Australia and the other state bodies to promote and support reconciliation and moving, to, and moving beyond the divide. Reconciliation Australia has identified five integral and interrelated dimensions to measure reconciliation, being race relation, equality and equity, institutional integrity, unity and historical acceptance. Work is needed in each of these areas to achieve true reconciliation. These five dimensions do not exist in isolation and none, of, none can be sacrificed or forgotten in the fight for change, acceptance and unity across our nation. I believe Australia is ready for this change. I believe we saw this in the outcomes of the recent election and we read through the 2021 statement of Reconciliation Australia report by Reconciliation Australia, it is evident that people are ready for change. In fact, the report identified that 95% of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and 91% of Australians in the general community feel our relationship is important. 93% of Australian and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and 89% of Australians in the general community supporting formal truth-telling processes in relation to Australia's shared history. And most of us also believe that education about our shared past is critical, with 83% of our, the general community and 91% of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people agreeing that it is important for Indigenous histories and cultures to be taught in school. A true coming together would require honesty, open-mindedness and the desire to unite. I believe that this can only be achieved if we understand each other as a whole people. By this, I mean that every individual, regardless of race, is built through their lifetime. How we are raised, how we think, how we feel and how we see the world shapes and creates the muscles and tissues that hold memories, perspective and ideologies. If we think of each other as whole people rather than just focus on one's occupation, race, income or intellect, we can start to unpack and recognise all people share many things. A love of family, desire for a better life for our kids, a desire for, to be happy and we are much more than just a sum of historical experiences. Because of some of these past experiences, though, our people are still healing. But to be able to think about moving forward, we also need to address the wrongs that are happening today. A perfect example is the Bringing Them Home report, which was published 25 years ago. Most of the report recommendations are yet to be implemented. And members of the Stolen Generation and their families continue to be affected by trauma caused by forced removal. In fact, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in our in out of home care has increased since bringing the home report has been released. If this doesn't prove the point, look at the numbers of indigenous deaths in custody and very recent destruction of sacred sites and understand that these new wounds will also require healing. We need to understand that while we can't change the past, we can learn from it. Keeping with this year's theme, be brave, make change. We need to be brave enough to learn our true history. And I say be brave because it isn't pretty and our whole history can be hard to hear but we also need to be brave enough to be the change that is needed. Make change calls for us to do things differently. I believe we Australians are a proud nation in so many ways, but that is an incomplete picture. For us to be a whole nation, we need to own all of our history. In order to know where we are going, we need to know where we came from. And although we have a dark history together by accepting each other's differences and understanding each other's understanding each other better, the general Australian population is able to learn about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and their culture, one that is the oldest continuing culture in the world. And I think that is something to be really proud of, something that all of us can be really proud of. Thank you for inviting me to speak with you here today. Congratulations on your reconciliation work that you do. Reconciliation Queensland looks forward to hearing about how well you are doing. And thank you. Thank you. Leads us to the last item on our agenda, which is talking about our stretch wrap. So, Kat, if you could just, I don't think this, can I just try this? Nothing's working. It's all good. Uh, so, Kat, if you could, um, oh, I just had a photo there. That was in 2016, and he hasn't changed a bit, has he? Um, he said he, um, got older, but um, Adrian looking great there. That was, as I say, yeah, um, down at the radio station. I can't remember what it's called, um, down in uh, West End. So we launched our wrap 2016. Next slide. Now, um, we haven't sent around our stretch wrap to you yet, but we will. But I wanted to talk, before we go into the detail about the cover of our stretch wrap, 
and a little bit of a story um, from the artist. And that person, some of you may have heard of Auntie Venus Rabbit from Sherberg. So anyone know Auntie Venus? You know of her? Yep. Okay. I have written it down because I wanted to get it right. Um, now, I did speak with Annie Venus earlier this week. I, I gave her a phone call um, and she was driving at the time with her sister and she's going around teaching some young children in the area around Sherberg um, some painting skills. So we were going to try to get her to dial in today. She wishes she could have uh, and she wishes us all the best with our stretch wrap. But that photo was taken in February 2020 just before the pandemic hit, Kat and I, Kat who's over there, we drove out to Sherberg um, to meet with Aunty Venus and that was the painting she'd done. So I'll just tell you a little bit of a story about Aunty Venus. So Aunty Venus Rabbit, she's an artist and a storyteller. Her father was a waka waka storyteller and she learned her storytelling and artistic skills from him. Aunty Venus has exhibited her artwork in many places around the world from Brisbane to Bangkok. She's a great storyteller and has assisted in the production of many of the local Budbara's children's books and films. So we first met Auntie Venus in February 2016, and then we caught up again in uh, February 2020, when some checkup staff, including me, um, visited Sherberg as a follow-up to a checkup-funded cataract surgery initiative that had taken place in Roma earlier that month. Uh, so yeah, we the patients all went back to Sherberg and myself and Jackie, who coordinates our surgery program, we went to Sherberg and just um, met Auntie Venus in the waiting room of the clinic there and just got chatting. She said she was a painter and she invited us up to her home uh, and she was working on a painting at the time. Um, so, yes, she, and at the time um, she was having her follow-up appointment, she, her sight had dramatically improved and she was able to paint again. So she hadn't been painting um, for some time because of her um, vision. And she, I remember what she said at the time, and I, I remember the way she said it, she said, I can see bright colours again and it's wonderful. So as I said, she was working on the painting. We've actually got video footage. Can you go to the next slide, Kat? Uh, the next one, yeah. So that was the painting she was working on in 2016. And as I say, we were, we were there as she was completing it. It was about half finished at the time. Um, and it's called Kangaroo Dreaming. It depicts her three elders, her father, grandfather, and great-grandfather, who were strong men who meant a lot to Annie Venus. These men encouraged her to paint from an early age. And that was all just by coincidence. We met her, saw her painting, and we used that painting as the cover of our Innovate Wrap, which we launched later in 2016. As I said, we caught up with Annie Venus again in Sherberg in February 2020. Uh, we had actually just come across it on the internet that she'd won an art prize. Um, and we gave her a call and um, drove out there. Uh, Annie Venus reported that her vision was better than ever and she was painting more than ever before. She showed us a painting she had completed recently called Spring Water, uh, which you can see there, and which is up in our office upstairs in our foyer, uh, which depicted her local area of Sherberg. This painting, as I said, won first prize in the Indigenous Art category at the 2019 South Burnett Open Art Competition. So we knew then and there that that painting by Arnie Venus would be the perfect cover for our stretch wrap. And there it is today. So that is the cover of our uh, stretch wrap, which is on our website. And today we are officially launching it. And Anne-Marie, um, I'll hand over to you now. And what we, we're not going to go through, obviously, the whole document. You can have a look at it in your own time. But reconciliation action plans are constructed around four pillars of uh, respect, relationship, opportunities, and governance. So we're gonna give you just a snapshot of some of the activities we have 
in our reconciliation action plan. So, Kat, if you could do the um, uh, yeah. Oh, that's it. We did have our first wrap. As I said, that was um the cover of the first wrap. But since then, yeah, we've used Arnie Venus's um work. Um. Okay, so the first pillar is relationships, and I'll hand over to you, Anne Marie. Thanks, thanks, David. Um, I'm, my internet is just a little bit unstable, so I'm hoping that you can hear me um, and that it, it'll go okay. Anyway, um, if I drop out, uh, David or someone might just have to step in um, for me. So it's been a really great morning. I uh, just wanted to provide just a little bit of technical feedback, David, um, in that I think for our on, online participants, the slides are not moving. So we're just seeing... Um, a slide view, uh, not the presentation view. So I just think we need to scroll down a little bit so we can move on to the other slides. So um, just while we see if we can um, get that addressed for our online participants, uh, again, just to echo to say, um, as David and Kieran have both said, uh, reconciliation journey for Queensland uh, up for checkup has really been going on for over 10 years. And as I, you know, I've been really privileged to be part of that journey for that whole time together um, with others on our staff and board and also some of our really valued uh, partners and stakeholders. And I think um, the theme of this year's Aboriginal um, National Reconciliation Week of Be Brave, Make Change is probably been something that we've really had to embrace um, throughout our reconciliation journey. Uh, it is a difficult and challenging experience. And I think as Erin said before, um, truth telling can be very confronting. And I think for many of us in our organization who perhaps hadn't had the opportunity to learn about our um, our history and our shameful history at times as Australians, that um, it really was a very confronting experience. And so it has required people to really, I think, seek to understand and on an ongoing basis, really continue to see how we can be brave and make change. So um, I wanted first to start off by acknowledging uh, the the really critical role of our cultural advisor, Dr. Mary Martin. Unfortunately, Mary couldn't be with us today. Mary has been on our reconciliation journey since its start back in 2013. And she, her guidance, her advice and her wisdom have really been uh, in, really uh, integral to our journey as an organisation and our maturing of our understanding of reconciliation. And, and Mary has been, I guess, the driver behind many um, education and training events and cultural awareness training for our staff together um, that we've done jointly and done quite a lot of those events with our uh, partner Quake and their staff. And I really want to acknowledge and pay tribute to Mary. And I'm sure if she was with us today. I, I hope that she would be proud of where we are at with our stretch wrap. And um, I look forward to talking to her about that, hopefully in the not too distant future. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Tony Coburn um, for his contribution, uh, again, as a cultural advisor um, to the development of our wrap, as well as the many uh, board directors, um, staff, and external parties, particularly the uh, Aboriginal community controlled health organisations across Queensland, who provided really valuable feedback to us and um, who continue to be really valued partners to us, in, not only in our reconciliation journey, but in um, informing and guiding the, de the development and delivery of our programs that are targeting um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, individuals, families and communities across Queensland. So as uh, David said, our, uh, our stretch wrap, and I think what probably was most um, challenging about the stretch wrap was that we were determined in, in what we did to ensure that it was very much a stretch. So whilst our earlier reflect wrap and innovate wrap, uh, we were able to have uh, perhaps, you know, somewhat of an internal focus um, for us and our development as an organisation. I think what has been um, 
most what has struck us most about the development of a stretch wrap and our discussions is that a stretch wrap really requires us to be um, as an organization as our staff within an organization to be brave to speak out to actually uh, do more um, in terms of engaging with our communities our families um, our staff our stakeholders and to have those very brave conversations, um, most of which relate to truth telling, but also to call out where there are um, areas of racism that we recognize in our organization. So I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. As David said, we have four um, areas in our wrap, um, four pillars, uh, first being uh, relationships. And I'm not gonna go into every detail of the deliverables and the actions. Um, I'm sure if you're interested, you'll be able to see that from our um, the wrap document that you can um, access or we'll in, provide you with a link to. But some of the most important things um, in relation to our relationships is that what we really wanna do is spread the news about the importance of having a reconciliation action plan. And so we really have identified that we want to encourage and assist at least one and hopefully more of our partner organisations who perhaps haven't, haven't had a wrap uh, to develop their first wrap and um, ensure they're linked to Reconciliation Australia and also to Reconciliation Queensland. So as Erin said, um, we are really helping each other and then making use of the valuable resources that are um, available to us and have been developed by organisations such as Reconciliation Queensland. But first and foremost, recognising that it's our responsibility to take a leadership role and uh, to make that brave step of um, having a reconciliation action plan. I think um, there are some other areas there that we've talked about to really look at our anti-discrimination and other relevant policies to ensure, again, that there is no opportunity for our organisation that we will not tolerate racism in our organisation and that we're ensuring that that's reflected in our policies and, and equally in terms of communicating that to our um, members and external stakeholders. Um, as you know, or those of you who know some of the work of um, CheckUp, you know that we do a lot of work in rural and remote communities across Queensland. Um, we, um, many of our staff, staff visit uh, communities and meet with um, local families and um, advisors. So we really want to ensure that we are consulting appropriately with our local traditional owners and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander advisors and looking at developing an updated cultural learning strategy for our organisation. Um, linked to that is also um, the development of a new cultural protocol document. Um, so that will be tailored for all of the communities where we operate throughout the state and ensuring that there are valuable guides for our staff and other stakeholders that ensure that we are following the cultural protocols required of that community. Uh, we've also got some ideas around naming a grant and award or a scholarship in honour of one of our key cultural advisors. So that's something that will be a very exciting development and that we um, look to progress. So the next area, as we've talked about before, is really looking at how we are actively making uh, creating opportunities uh, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander staff to join and work as part of our organisation. Um, so we've already talked about that we want to increase that percentage of staff. Um, we've said in our um, activities that we want to increase it to 10% of our total staff. Um, I actually think we'll be, we'll be beyond 10%. Uh, we, we really want to um, move to, you know, perhaps 10 to 15 percent, and I think we'll be able to meet that target. And as I said before, what we want to ensure is that we're not just talking about entry level positions. As important as those entry positions are, uh, we need to ensure that there are identified positions across all levels of our organisation, um, and that includes board and management. Uh, uh, I think, you know, again, that we want to promote and uh, showcase um, the work that is happening at a local level and we want to create actively create opportunities for our partners 
um, and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Services to showcase their work and to show, as I, go, I guess going back to what Haleen said, um, around the strength of First Nations people doing work for, for together with First Nations people. So really providing opportunities or creating opportunities to showcase some of that work and the difference that it makes. Uh, in terms of governance, which is our final pillar, that's the fourth pillar, um, we probably have already um, made some reference to um, establishing, or we have already, Kieran said that we've established an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Advisory Committee, which is chaired by Kieran, and there are other members of that group that are um, listed there. Um, Sean uh, previously worked for Fred Hollis Foundation and is now with the Eye Health Unit um, at, run by a Uni of Melbourne, but Sean is actually based in the Northern Territory. So we're trying to get a diversity of views and we're looking to increase the membership of that group as time progresses. Um, I've talked already about the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander lead role. And we're also doing a lot of work at the moment around refining our child safety framework. And importantly, we want that child safety framework to address um, the well-being and safety of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children who access checkup programs and services. So to give reassurance um, to our, the communities that we serve that we are very much focused on the safety and well-being of, our, of children and that they can feel confident that in working with checkup, we have uh, a workforce that understands uh, and uh, I guess not only complies but respects um, the importance of those child safety principles. So that's a really brief look um, at our stretch wrap. As I said, it contains um, a lot of areas that are very much going to stretch us as an organisation. And um, we are going to be calling on the support of our um, advisory group, our cultural advisors and our partners uh, in, in order to meet and achieve um, what are fairly ambitious changes for us. But I think, you know, we have to start um, it talks today, the theme of National Reconciliation Week talks about be brave, make change, and that for each of us, we have to reflect on in our own lives, in our contacts, in our, you know, not only in our work lives, but in our um, interaction with our families, in our social interactions, how we can take those um, important steps of being brave and making change in our own lives and those around us. And I think that's um, what I'm, you know, most uh, what's most important for us today and for us to walk away um, to reflect on what are the changes that we can each make individually that collectively um, can make a change um, and have a significant impact for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. It is really what I'd like to you know, leave you with is that message of the importance of each of us um, being brave to make those changes. It's sometimes um, not easy. Um, but together, I think we can make a difference. Uh, that's the stretch wrap overall. I, you know, today is very much a focus on, um, you know, National Reconciliation Action Week, uh, National Reconciliation Week. But I would like to, we'd also like to ask you to support us in launching our stretch wrap today and acknowledging uh, the journey that we continue uh, along in our reconciliation journey. And I'd like to say thank you to all of the staff, particularly to David uh, for his leadership of this work and today's event, uh, but also to all of the staff. I'm very proud uh, to work for Checkup and very proud of the work that we do. And I guess this is one uh, example of the commitment that we have to making a difference and recognising, of course, that um, the journey is an ongoing one. It's not complete today. So thank you um, to everyone for being involved. Uh, I'm going to hand over, I believe, David, uh, you're going to introduce um, an important representative who's here today, and that's our sponsor from HESTA. Thanks, Anne-Marie. So I guess uh, officially launched. Um, we don't have a ribbon to cut or anything, but um, the, the wrap is launched. It's actually been finished for a few months. And as Anne-Marie said, we have started our implementation uh, in 2022. So thanks for that. Um,
before we have hear from um, Hester, who's our sponsor today, just also like to acknowledge um, there's about a dozen Quake staff members here today. So check up um, shares a tenancy here with Quake. Uh, so great that you could come along. And the Quake CEO, um, Cleveland Fagan, um, did send his apologies today. Um, couldn't be here, but great to see so many Quake staff here uh, today. We had a, an informal morning tea yesterday, just to, we haven't seen a lot of each other over the last two years, um, but it's great that you're here with us again today. Okay, as Emery said, um, these sort of events, you know, wouldn't be possible without, um, as a not-for-profit, um, Checkup does rely on um, sponsorship and, and, and corporate support uh, for many of our events. And HESTA has been doing that, particularly for these Queensland primary healthcare meetings um, for a few years now. And today we've got a new representative from HESTA, the first time um, Brad Tiley, who's a business development man manager at HESTA. I think you've been in the role about six months. Yeah, so great that you're joining us today and um, please welcome Brad, who's going to give us a five minute presentation. We're ahead of time too, so I'll keep it concise. That's okay. Yep, around the work of HESTA in supporting um, not just superannuation, but also um, reconciliation. So thanks. Fantastic. I'll do the slides for you. You want to do the slides? I know we had some uh, technical issues this morning. So, um, it's just before we do start, um, I wish to acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and the culture that enrich this nation, and we pay our respects to elders past and present, um, as we acknowledge the important contribution that first Australians make in creating a strong and vibrant Australian society. With this event today, we're actually um, pretty proud, proud to be part of it all. Um, I'm sure you agree over the last, what is it, hour and a half, there's been some fantastic presentations a lot of great insights that um, I'm sure we can actually take away with us today. But what I'll get you to do is just go down, if you don't mind, to the third slide. Um, just a little bit of a snapshot of Hester in the marketplace at the moment. Currently, we're fortunate enough to be serving about 900,000 members. We're managing close to $70 billion worth of assets. Um, but more importantly, we're probably the largest industry super fund dedicated to the health and community services sector. And with that, one of the values that we'd like to sort of bring to organisations is the fact that when we are looking to partner with organisations, we really want to make sure that we can empower employees and our members to be able to make sound financial decisions for themselves over the long term, and therefore obviously work towards having that dignified retirement. One of the unique parts that I actually believe in and why I've sort of come across the HESTA about six months ago is when we're managing $70 billion worth of assets, HESTA actually does understand we have a responsibility. Um, and with that responsibility, we also have influence to be able to actually address real world issues that are, are, are definitely front of mind. So when we look at our responsible investing mandate, a lot of the time we sort of think responsible investing is about investing our members' money in a, in a conscientious way. And, and to an extent, that, that's correct. We like to take it a little bit uh, a step further and when we look into partner with organisations and as an investee, we really like to try and unpack three key, era, key areas around environmental, social and government risks. And we think that's important because what we'd like to do with the scale that we do have is be able to have active management. And by actually having active management um, within the sector, we actually believe we can actually drive sustainable long term growth for our members but more importantly, have an impact in relation to the communities that not only live and work in, but we're also looking to retire in as well. I guess with the active management, there was probably a little bit of a watershed moment back in May 2020 with the destruction of the cultural heritage caves in Jukran Gorge um, with Rio Tinto. And probably some of the lessons that we learned that was highlighted from that event is the fact that we actually probably need to engage further um, with the first Australian organisations working in the communities, but also leaders to be able to hear directly from them their concerns and hear how we can actually advocate better for them on, on their behalf. Um, when we look at it, our ESG footprint, we understand that it's a maturing area, um, but we honestly believe that history is definitely driving and, and leaders within that field. And going forward, we want to make sure that we can get other investees to the table to be able to undertake those ESG considerations as well. 
Um, David, just to get you to go to the next slide and then we'll go, might as well go to the next one as well. Um, our wrap, we're currently in the process of working on our third our stretch wrap. Um, obviously, it's been built off the back of, of our first two. And I want to sort of go back to our reflect wrap because it was all about celebrating the fantastic work that the nurses and midwives do within the community. I think uh, a lot of that work definitely goes unnoticed. And I'm sure we'll agree that nurses and midwives that work in the sector at the moment, they do a fantastic job. They really do touch the lives of so many. But so often, the fantastic work that's been done out in regional areas goes unnoticed. Um, and we'd like to try and build further awareness, awareness around that. Um, and we also understand that a lot of the members that we actually are partnering with at the moment, they're doing some fantastic work to be able to change or close that health gap. And more importantly, be able to empower other generations that are coming through and, and pave the way for, for them to make their, their career or start their journey. Just lastly, I'm gonna finish up on, whilst we are a workplace super fund, we're very big on that awareness piece. Um, some of the things that we do do that a lot of people may or may not be aware of is the sector awards. Um, and it's our way of giving back a little bit and providing the ability to have a platform to build further awareness around the great work that certain organisations are doing. We're currently in the, uh, what is it, the early education and education care awards. And more recently, we just had the HESTA Australian Nursing and Midwifery Awards. Um, so I'll just get to go to that last slide. With these awards, we definitely want to be talking to organisations in relation to partnering, putting some nominations together. We understand that to be nominated can go a long way in being able to build culture within organisations. But more importantly, if this is something you can actually look for leverage off, we'd definitely like to um, extend the olive branch and, and to help in, in, in that respect. Just to finish up today, I'll just get to sorry, go back up to one. That's a, not the best photo of me, don't worry about that. Um, I want to go back. So Tracy Stevens took out the Hester Midwife of the Year Award back in 2019. Um, the reason why I wanted to focus on that, especially for today's event, is I believe her statement sort of sums up the importance the awards can play. And I do apologise. I'm going to read this. Um, but it, she mentioned that, I know that seeing Aboriginal nurses and midwives change the perception of what Aboriginal people can be and do. We are role models in the community and we can be leaders for change if we are supported and empowered to be. I think self-determination is about Aboriginal people being able to choose where they go, whether it's Aboriginal organisations or mainstream hospitals, and they should be able to choose how and where they get the best care for themselves. I'm going to leave it on that note today. Um, once again, really do appreciate being part of today's event. I've definitely been able to walk away with some insights. And if there's anything you'd like to discuss further, please, yeah, I'll be hanging around a little bit after the event today. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. Okay, that brings us to the end of uh, today's session. So really like to thank everyone who's presented today. I won't name them all, but uh, I think you'll agree. Um, really great presentations, lots to think about. Um, really great to have Adrian um, back um, with us. Uh, so yeah, I guess let's give a round of applause to all our speakers today.